the Insane Clown Posse is a popular rap group, known to have a very loyal audience known as Juggalos. Now while most of these people are good, honest folk, some of them take things a little too far. And today we'll talk about a few of these cases. Over the years, the clown has become an extremely powerful symbol in internet culture. From evil ones chasing people around the woods to them representing the nihilistic filter many people see the world through, the Joker ironically representing how gamers are oppressed in the society we live in, and even what we refer to people as when they make a bad hot take on Twitter. They are truly all over the place, but one of the strangest groups of clown culture reside in the Juggalo community the dedicated fans of the Insane Clown Posse. ICP is a rap group formed in Detroit, Michigan in 1989. The group was founded by Joseph Bruce and Joseph Utzler, under the stage names Violent J and Shaggy 2 Dope, respectively. As the years went on, the two gained a sizable collection of devoted fans. At a show in 1994 during the song The Juggala, Bruce referred to the crowd in front of him as Juggalos, and the name stuck. Juggalos can often be found wearing black and white clown face paint, imitating the makeup worn by the band themselves. Many take it so far that it has become a lifestyle to them. Unfortunately, the rappers along with their followers have attracted the stereotype of not being the most upstanding of citizens. Connections with drugs and crime have attracted the attention of the FBI to the group. On top of this, Violent J and Shaggy 2 Dope have made songs criticized as being purposely ignorant of the world around them, such as in Miracles where they imply that magnets were magic, and that scientists' explanations of how they worked were in fact lies. This has all led to their meme status in the online community. I may go into more detail about the group itself in a future video, but today you just need to know that the Insane Clown Posse have attracted the attention, as well as the adoration of some of the most extreme people in the hip-hop fan community, and they have done some truly insane things over the years, including violent crimes. Because the Insane Clown Posse's label, Psychopathic Records, is known for its logo of a man wielding a hatchet, it should be no coincidence that it's a weapon of choice for many juggalos. So today we'll be examining a few of the cases of juggalo crimes committed with either hatchets, axes, or cleavers by fans of the group. Jacob Robito was an 18-year-old who lived with his mother in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He was a troubled kid seeming to have very few friends, but the one thing he connected with in life was music, more specifically the insane clown posse. On his MySpace page, Robito was a proud juggalo, going by the name Jake Jekyll and sporting the classic juggalo makeup in his profile picture. Since MySpace originated as a network for music, his postings about his adoration for psychopathic records wasn't anything out of the ordinary. What was more troubling on the page, however, were his writings about Jacob's love and fascination with death, serial killers, and general evil. On top of that, it showed his extremist leanings, with a section where he flat out called himself a neo-Nazi. On the surface, it may have just looked like a page of a racist, edgy teenager from the 2000s, but given what came next, the warning signs should have been taken more seriously. On the night of February 2nd, 2006, Robita managed to enter a local gay bar called Puzzles using a fake ID. After having a short chat with the bartender and a couple of drinks, Jacob made his intentions very clear, when he pulled out a hatchet and began attacking a fellow patron. He was quickly tackled by a group of people, at which point he pulled out a handgun and began firing wildly into the crowd. He injured three people before fleeing the scene in his car. After the attack of puzzles, police went to the home of Jacob's mother in order to investigate. According to her, he had returned home an hour after the attack and was bleeding from the head, but quickly left and hadn't been seen since. In Jacob's room, authorities found a large number of weapons, including knives, a shotgun, and a katana. What was stranger was it appeared Jacob had built himself a makeshift coffin, reaffirming reports of his fascination with death. They also found a letter, the contents of which seemed to be some sort of manifesto slash suicide note, littered with anti-Semitic sentiment. As he made his escape through the country with law enforcement on his tail, Jacob stopped in West Virginia to pick up a woman named Jennifer Bailey, whom he had lived with for some time in 2004. 
It's unclear why he did this, and even after searching through old emails between the two, authorities were still unsure if she was kidnapped or if she joined Jacob willingly. Robita and Bailey continued to drive across the country. That is, until they were stopped by Jim Cell in Arkansas, a police officer who recognized the official FBI alert for the car. Panicking before having a chance to be arrested, Jacob quickly shot and killed Cell before speeding off. As he fled down the highway, police put out spike traps which, while not completely stopping him, did manage to burst his two front tires. Eventually, Robita lost control of his car and crashed it. As Jacob was cornered, he began to exchange gunfire with police. There was nowhere to run but to death itself. This is when Jacob shot Bailey in the head and then himself killing them both on the spot. In the aftermath, many were trying to make sense of this troubled young man's actions. What would cause someone with their life ahead of them to be consumed with so much darkness to go out and commit such heinous crimes? Some were quick to blame the media Jacob consumed for his violent actions. Perhaps the biggest name among these was Jack Thompson, who blamed such games as Postal and Grand Theft Auto for the young man's rampage. Others were quick to blame it on the fact that Jacob was a juggalo, but the insane clown posse was quick to condemn his actions in a statement that read, Today I'd like to speak out about the incident which took place in New Bedford, Massachusetts. This guy had problems. Anyone going into a bar swinging an axe and shooting a gun would have to realize that they would get caught and or get killed, and that this would be the last action they took for the rest of their lives, and would clearly have to be insane and out of their mind to do this, in my opinion. The perpetrator of this crime committed these acts not because he was a juggalo, but because he was a neo-Nazi. He subscribed to an ideology of racism and bigotry, and was quite clearly, in my opinion, out of his mind. On a hot summer morning in 2008, a teenager was sleeping in his room in a small Utah town. That was until two 21-year-old juggalos stormed into his residence without invitation. Apparently, one of the two intruders was upset with the teenager because he had been texting with a girl with whom he had been involved with. On top of that, the man believed that he had received an STD from the girl, which he concluded she had gotten from the boy. In retaliation for the alleged misdeeds, the two adult men ambushed the minor as he slept. This is when they began repeatedly stabbing the boy with a knife. As if this wasn't bad enough, following the initial attack, the men pulled out a secret weapon that they had brought along with them as well, a medieval four-sided battle axe. As the teenager laid in his bedroom debilitated, one of the men lifted up the cumbersome weapon and swung it down on the back of the kid's neck. After this, the attackers quickly fled the scene, but police noticed something they left behind during their investigation. A piece of jewelry associated with the insane clown posse, which quickly led them to think the attackers were juggalos. Not long after this, police tracked down a car the witnesses had spotted escaping the boy's house after the crime. The car was adorned with Juggalo and Insane Clown Posse stickers, so it wasn't hard to connect the dots. The driver quickly confessed to the crime, and the duo were then arrested. Fortunately, even though it was an extremely violent attack, the victim was not killed, but he was left with severe injuries that required him to get a total of 300 stitches. Sean Freemore was a seemingly ordinary 19-year-old boy living in Price Township, Pennsylvania. Although perhaps a bit edgy and an outcast from his classmates, as well as being, of course, a fan of the Insane Clown Posse. Although being a normal and unassuming guy on the outside, no one could have guessed what Freemore would go on to do. The downfall of Sean began on a cold day in January when he made the acquaintance of the slightly older Michael Goucher, a 21-year-old military veteran. They talked for a bit, and then the two went back to Goucher's car where things became intimate. Filled with emotions after this first meeting, Sean agreed to meet up again, but things would go much worse the second time around. The night was February 3rd when Sean went off to meet Michael. When he arrived, Michael reportedly wanted to once again get intimate, but this time Sean refused and tried to leave the scene. When Michael followed him, Sean proceeded to whip out a blade and stab him in the neck and abdomen. Sean finally covered Mr. Goucher's body in snow before fleeing the scene in the deceased man's car. 
leaving it less than a mile from where he left the corpse. Police discovered Goucher's body a week later, and Freemore quickly admitted to the killing. He was charged with homicide, aggravated assault, tampering with evidence, as well as robbery since Goucher's wallet and car keys would still not be found even after the investigation. During questioning, Freemore coldly told authorities that he was unemployed, as well as being addicted to drugs and alcohol. One thing many people found interesting after the fact was the striking resemblance between Freemore's crime and the Insane Clown Posse song, Me Cleaver. The song itself is about murdering people with a meat cleaver and also includes a reference to army jackets, which some people link to Goucher's military service. Given that Freemore was a fan of the Insane Clown Posse, as well as the fact that a meat cleaver was a bizarre weapon to be carrying around, onlookers couldn't help but wonder if the young man had been inspired in some way by the song. It has never been completely explained what Sean's motives were for murdering a man in cold blood, and the truth is we may never fully know. Now I just want to clarify that most Juggalos are perfectly fine people, if not in a weird fan base. So while a lot of them are doing crazy things, most of them are perfectly fine. And with that note, I think I'll end the video here. So until next time, thanks for watching. <laughs>